This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa. Michael.Sirwa, S I R O I S, dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book Two The Ancient Times. Book Two, Chapter One The First Clothes. One day St. Mail was sitting by the seashore, on a warm stone that he had found. He thought it had been warmed by the sun, and he gave thanks to God for it, not knowing that the devil had been resting on it. The apostle was waiting for the monks of Yvern, who had been commissioned to bring a freight of skins and fabrics to clothe the inhabitants of the island of Alca. Soon he saw a monk called Magus, coming ashore and carrying a chest upon his back. This monk enjoyed a great reputation for holiness. When he had drawn near to the old man, he laid the chest on the ground, and wiping his forehead with the back of his sleeve, he said, Well, father, you wish then to clothe these penguins? Nothing is more needful, my son, said the old man. Since they have been incorporated into the family of Abraham, these penguins share the curse of Eve, and they know that they are naked a thing of which they were ignorant before. And it is high time to clothe them, for they are losing the down that remained on them after their metamorphosis. It is true, said Magus, as he cast his eyes over the coast, where the penguins were to be seen looking for shrimps, gathering mussels, singing or sleeping. They are naked. But do you not think, father, that it would be better to leave them naked? Why clothe them? When they wear clothes and are under the moral law, they will assume an immense pride, a vile hypocrisy, and an excessive cruelty. Is it possible, my son, sighed the old man, that you understand so badly the effects of the moral law to which even the heathen submit? The moral law, answered Magus, forces men who are beasts to live otherwise than beasts a thing that doubtless puts a constraint upon them, but that also flatters and reassures them, and as they are proud, cowardly, and covetous of pleasure, they willingly submit to restraints that tickle their vanity, and on which they found both their present security and the hope of their future happiness. That is the principle of all morality. But let us not mislead ourselves. My companions are unloading their cargo of stuffs and skins on the island. Think, father, while there is still time, to clothe the penguins is a very serious business. At present, when a penguin desires a penguin, he knows precisely what he desires, and his lust is limited by an exact knowledge of its object. At this moment, two or three couples of penguins are making love on the beach. See with what simplicity... No one pays any attention, and the actors themselves do not seem to be greatly preoccupied. But when the female penguins are clothed, the male penguin will not form so exact a notion of what it is that attracts him to them. His indeterminate desires will fly out into all sorts of dreams and illusions. In short, father, he will know love, and its mad torments and all the time the female penguins will cast down their eyes and bite their lips and take on airs, as if they kept a treasure under their clothes. What a pity! The evil will be endurable as long as these people remain rude and poor. But only wait for a thousand years, and you will see, father, with what powerful weapons you have endowed the daughters of Alca. If you will allow me, I can give you some idea of it beforehand. I have some old clothes in this chest. Let us take a hazard at one of the female penguins, to whom the male penguins give such little thought, and let us dress her as well as we can. Here is one coming towards us. She is neither more beautiful nor uglier than the others. She is young. No one looks at her. She strolls indolently along the shore, scratching her back, and with her finger at her nose as she walks. You cannot help seeing, father, that she has narrow shoulders, clumsy breasts, a stout figure, and short legs. Her reddish knees pucker at every step she takes, and there is, at each of her joints, 
what looks like a little monkey's head. Her broad and sinewy feet cling to the rock with their four crooked toes, while the great toes stick up like the heads of two cunning serpents. She begins to walk. All her muscles are engaged in the task, and when we see them working, we think of her as a machine intended for walking, rather than as a machine intended for making love although visibly she is both, and contains within herself several other pieces of machinery besides. Well, venerable apostle, you will see what I am going to make of her. With these words the monk, Magus, reached the female penguin in three bounds, lifted her up, carried her in his arms, with her hair trailing behind her, and threw her, overcome with fright, at the feet of the holy male and whilst she wept and begged him to do her no harm, he took a pair of sandals out of his chest, and commanded her to put them on. "'Her feet,' observed the old man, "'will appear smaller when squeezed in by the woollen cords. The soles, being two fingers high, will give an elegant length to her legs, and the weight they bear will seem magnified.' As the penguin tied on her sandals, she threw a curious look towards the open coffer and seeing that it was full of jewels and finery, she smiled through her tears. The monk twisted her hair on the back of her head, and covered it with a chaplet of flowers. He encircled her wrist with golden bracelets, and making her stand upright, he passed a large linen band beneath her breasts, alleging that her bosom would thereby derive a new dignity, and that her sides would be compressed to the greater glory of her hips. He fixed this band with pins, taking them one by one out of his mouth. "'You can tighten it still more,' said the penguin. When he had with much care and study enclosed the soft parts of her bust in this way, he covered her whole body with a rose-coloured tunic, which gently followed the lines of her figure. "'Does it hang well?' asked the penguin. And bending forward, with her head on one side and her chin on her shoulder, she kept looking attentively at the appearance of her toilette. Magus asked her if she did not think the dress a little long, but she answered with assurance that it was not. She would hold it up. Immediately, taking the back of her skirt in her left hand, she drew it obliquely across her hips, taking care to disclose a glimpse of her heels. Then she went away, walking with short steps and swinging her hips. She did not turn her head, but as she passed near a stream she glanced out of the corner of her eye at her own reflection. A male penguin, who met her by chance, stopped in surprise, and retracing his steps began to follow her. As she went along the shore, others coming back from fishing went up to her, and after looking at her walked behind her. Those who were lying on the sand got up and joined the rest. Unceasingly, as she advanced, fresh penguins descending from the paths of the mountain, coming out of clefts of the rocks, and emerging from the water, added to the size of her retinue. And all of them, men of ripe age, with vigorous shoulders and hairy breasts, agile youths, old men shaking the multitudinous wrinkles of their rosy and white-haired skins, or dragging their legs thinner and drier than the juniper staff that served them as a third leg, hurried on, panting and emitting an acrid odor and hoarse gasps. Yet she went on peacefully, and seemed to see nothing. Father! cried Magus. Notice how each one advances with his nose pointed towards the centre of gravity of that young damsel, now that the centre is covered by a garment. The sphere inspires the meditations of geometers by the number of its properties. When it proceeds from a physical and living nature, it acquires new qualities, and in order that the interest of that figure might be fully revealed to the penguins, it was necessary that, ceasing to see it distinctly with their eyes, they should be led to represent it to themselves in their minds. I myself feel at this moment irresistibly attracted towards that penguin, whether it be because her skirt gives more importance to her hips, and that in its simple magnificence it invests them with a synthetic and general character and allows only the pure idea, the, the divine principle of them to be seen, whether this be the cause I cannot say, but I feel that if I embraced her I would hold in my hands the heaven of human pleasure. It is certain that modesty communicates an invincible attraction to women. 
My uneasiness is so great that it would be vain for me to try to conceal it. He spoke, and gathering up his habit, he rushed among the crowd of penguins, pushing, jostling, trampling, and crushing, until he reached the daughter of Alca, whom he seized, and suddenly carried in his arms into a cave that had been hollowed out by the sea. Then the penguins felt as if the sun had gone out, and the holy male knew that the devil had taken the features of the monk Magus, in order that he might give clothes to the daughter of Alca. He was troubled in spirit, and his soul was sad. As with slow steps he went towards his hermitage, he saw the little penguins of six and seven years of age, tightening their waists with belts made of seaweed, and walking along the shore to see if anybody would follow them. End of chapter 1 Book 2 Chapter 2 The First Clothes Continuation and End The holy male felt a profound sadness that the first clothes put upon a daughter of Alca should have betrayed the penguin modesty instead of helping it. He persisted, none the less, in his design of giving clothes to the inhabitants of the miraculous island. Assembling them on the shore, he distributed to them the garments that the monks of Yvern had brought. The male penguins received short tunics and breeches, the female penguins long robes. But these robes were far from creating the effect that the former one had produced. They were not so beautiful, their shape was uncouth and without art, and no attention was paid to them since every woman had one. As they prepared the meals, and worked in the fields, they soon had nothing but slovenly bodices and soiled petticoats. The male penguins loaded their unfortunate consorts with work until they looked like beasts of burden. They knew nothing of the troubles of the heart and the disorders of passion. Their habits were innocent. Incest, though frequent, was a sign of rustic simplicity, and if drunkenness led a youth to commit some such crime, he thought nothing more about it the day afterwards. End of chapter 2 Book 2, Chapter 3 Setting Bounds to the Fields and the Origin of Property The island did not preserve the rugged appearance that it had formerly, when, in the midst of floating icebergs, it sheltered a population of birds within its rocky amphitheatre. Its snow-clad peak had sunk down into a hill, from the summit of which one could see the coasts of Armorica eternally covered with mist and the ocean, strewn with sullen reefs, like monsters half-raised out of its depths. Its coasts were now very extensive, and clearly defined, and its shape reminded one of a mulberry leaf. It was suddenly covered with coarse grass, pleasing to the flocks, and with willows, ancient fig-trees, and mighty oaks. This fact is attested by the Venerable Bede, and several other authors worthy of credence. To the north, the shore formed a deep bay that in after years became one of the most famous ports in the universe. To the east, along a rocky coast beaten by a foamy sea, there stretched a deserted and fragrant heath. It was the Beach of Shadows, and the inhabitants of the island never ventured on it for fear of the serpents that lodged in the hollows of the rocks, and lest they might encounter the souls of the dead, who resembled livid flames. To the south, Orchards and woods bounded the languid bay of divers. On this fortunate shore, Old Male built a wooden church and a monastery. To the west, two streams, the Clang and the Sorel, watered the fertile valleys of Dale and Dombe. Now one autumn morning, as the blessed Male was walking in the valley of Clang, in company with a monk of Yvern called Bullock, he saw bands of fierce-looking men, loaded with stones, passing along the roads. At the same time he heard in all directions cries and complaints mounting up from the valley towards the tranquil sky, and he said to Bullock, I notice with sadness, my son, that since they became men, the inhabitants of this island act with less wisdom than formerly. When they were birds, they only quarrelled during the season of their love affairs, but now they dispute all the time. They pick quarrels with each other in summer as well as in winter. How greatly have they fallen from that peaceful majesty which made the assembly of the penguins look like the senate of a wise republic! L look towards Sorel, Bullock, my son. In yonder pleasant valley 
a dozen men-penguins are busy knocking each other down with the spades and picks that they might employ better in tilling the ground. The women, still more cruel than the men, are tearing their opponents' faces with their nails. Alas, Bullock, my son, why are they murdering each other in this way? From a spirit of fellowship, father, and through forethought for the future, answered Bullock, for man is essentially provident and sociable, such is his character, and it is impossible to imagine it, apart from a certain appropriation of things. Those penguins whom you see are dividing the ground among themselves. Could they not divide it with less violence? asked the aged man. As they fight, they exchange invectives and threats. I do not distinguish their words, but they are angry ones, judging from the tone. They are accusing one another of theft and encroachment, answered Bullock. That is the general sense of their speech. Do you see, my son, he exclaimed, that madman who with his teeth is biting the nose of the adversary he has overthrown, and that other one who is pounding a woman's head with a huge stone? I see them, said Bullock. They are creating law. They are founding property. They are establishing the principles of civilization, the basis of society, and the foundations of the state. How is that? asked old Mail. By setting bounds to their fields. That is the origin of all government. Your penguins, O oh master, are performing the most august of functions. Throughout the ages their work will be consecrated by lawyers, and magistrates will confirm it. Whilst the monk Bullock was pronouncing these words, a big penguin with a fair skin and red hair went down into the valley carrying a trunk of a tree upon his shoulder. He went up to a little penguin who was watering his vegetables in the heat of the sun, and shouted to him, Your field is mine! And having delivered himself of this stout utterance, he brought down his club on the head of the little penguin, who fell dead upon the field that his own hands had tilled. At this sight the holy male shuddered through his whole body, and poured forth a flood of tears, and in a voice stifled by horror and fear he addressed this prayer to heaven. O oh, Lord, my God! O oh, Thou who didst receive young Abel's sacrifices! Thou who didst curse Cain! Avenge, O oh Lord, this innocent penguin sacrificed upon his own field, and make the murderer feel the weight of thy arm! Is there a more odious crime? Is there a graver offence against thy justice, O Lord, than, than this murder and this robbery? Take care, father, said Bullock gently, that what you call murder and robbery may not really be war and conquest, those sacred foundations of empires, those sources of all human virtues and all human greatness. Reflect above all that in blaming the big penguin, you are attacking property in its origin and in its source. Uh, I shall have no trouble in showing you how. To till the land is one thing, to possess it is another, and these two things must not be confused. As regards ownership, the right of the first occupier is uncertain and badly founded. The right of conquest, on the other hand, rests on more solid foundations. It is the only right that receives respect since it is the only one that makes itself respected. The sole and proud origin of property is force. It is born and preserved by force. In that it is august, and yields only to a greater force. This is why it is correct to say that he who possesses is noble. And that big red man, when he knocked down a laborer to get possession of his field, found it at that moment a very noble house upon this earth, I congratulate him upon it. Having thus spoken, Bullock approached the big penguin, who was leaning upon his club as he stood in the blood-stained furrow. Lord Greatock, dreaded prince, said he, bowing to the ground, I come to pay you the homage due to the founder of legitimate power and hereditary wealth. The skull of the vile penguin you have overthrown will, buried in your field, attest forever the sacred rights of your posterity over this soil that you have ennobled. Blessed be your sons, and your sons' sons. They shall be great hawks, dukes of skull, and they shall rule over this island of Alca. 
then raising his voice and turning towards the holy mail. Bless great talk, father, for all power comes from God. Mail remained silent and motionless, with his eyes raised towards heaven. He felt a painful uncertainty in judging the monk Bullock's doctrine. It was, however, the doctrine destined to prevail in epochs of advanced civilization. Bullock can be considered as the creator of civil law in Penguinia. End of chapter 3 Book 2, Chapter 4 The First Assembly of the Estates of Penguinia Bullock, my son, said old Mail, we ought to make a census of the penguins and inscribe each of their names in a book. It is a most urgent matter, answered Bullock. There can be no good government without it. Forthwith the apostle, with the help of twelve monks, proceeded to make a census of the people, and old Mail then said, Now that we keep a register of all the inhabitants, we ought, Bullock, my son, to levy a just tax so as to provide for public expenses and the maintenance of the abbey. Each ought to contribute according to his means. For this reason, my son, call together the elders of Alca, and in agreement with them we shall establish the tax. The elders, being called together, assembled to the number of thirty under the great sycamore in the courtyard of the wooden monastery. They were the first estates of Penguinia. Three-fourths of them were substantial peasants of Sorel and Klang. Great Auk, as the noblest of the penguins, sat upon the highest stone. The venerable male took his place in the midst of the monks and uttered these words. Children, the Lord, when he pleases, grants riches to men, and he takes them away from them. Now I have called you together to levy contributions from the people, so as to provide for public expenses and the maintenance of the monks. I consider that these contributions ought to be in proportion to the wealth of each. Therefore, he who has a hundred oxen will give ten, he who has ten will give one. When the holy man had spoken, Morio, a laborer at Annas on the Clang, one of the richest of the penguins, rose up and said, O oh, Father Male, I think it right that each should contribute to the public expenses and to the support of the church. On my part I am ready to give up all that I possess in the interest of my brother penguins, and if it were necessary I would even cheerfully part with my shirt. All the elders of the people are ready, like me, to sacrifice their goods, and no one can doubt their absolute devotion to their country and their creed. We have, then, only to consider the public interest and to do what it requires. Now, Father, what it requires, what it demands, is not to ask much from those who possess much, for then the rich would be less rich, and the poor still poorer. The poor live on the wealth of the rich, and that is the reason why that wealth is sacred. Do not touch it. To do so would be an uncalled-for evil. You will get no great profit by taking from the rich, for they are very few in number. On the contrary, you will strip yourself of all your resources and plunge the country into misery. Whereas, if you ask a little from each inhabitant without regard to his wealth, you will collect enough for the public necessities, and you will have no need to inquire into each citizen's resources, a thing that would be regarded by all as a most vexatious measure. By taxing all equally and easily, you will spare the poor, for you will leave them the wealth of the rich. And how could you possibly proportion taxes to wealth? Yesterday I had two hundred oxen. Today I have sixty. Tomorrow I shall have a hundred. Glunik has three cows, but they are thin. Niklu has only two, but they are fat. Which is the richer, Glunik or Niklu? The signs of opulence are deceitful. What is certain is that every one eats and drinks. Tax people according to what they consume. That would be wisdom, and it would be justice. Thus spoke Morio, amid the applause of the elders. "'I ask that this speech be graven on bronze,' cried the monk Bullock. "'It is spoken for the future. In fifteen hundred years the best of the penguins will not speak otherwise.' The elders were still applauding when Greatauk, his hand on the pommel of his sword, made this brief declaration. "'Being noble, I shall not contribute. 
for to contribute is ignoble. It is for the rabble to pay. After this warning, the elders separated in silence. As in Rome, a new census was taken every five years, and by this means it was observed that the population increased rapidly. Although children died in marvellous abundance, and plagues and famines came with perfect regularity to devastate entire villages, new penguins, in continually greater numbers, contributed by their private misery to the public prosperity. End of chapter 4 Book 2, Chapter 5 The Marriage of Kraken and Orborosia During these times there lived on the island of Alca a penguin, whose arm was strong and whose mind was subtle. He was called Kraken, and had his dwelling on the beach of shadows, whither the inhabitants never ventured, for fear of serpents that lodged in the hollows of the rocks, and lest they might encounter the souls of penguins that had died without baptism. These, in appearance like livid flames and uttering doleful groans, wandered night and day along the deserted beach. For it was generally believed, though without proof, that among the penguins that had been changed into men at the blessed male's prayer, several had not received baptism, and returned after their death to lament amid the tempests. Kraken dwelt on this savage coast in an inaccessible cavern. The only way to it was through a natural tunnel a hundred feet long, the entrance of which was concealed by a thick wood. One evening, as Kraken was walking through this deserted plain, he happened to meet a young and charming woman penguin. She was the one that the monk Magus had clothed with his own hands, and thus was the first to have worn the garments of chastity. In remembrance of the day when the astonished crowd of penguins had seen her moving gloriously in her robe, tinted like the dawn, this maiden had received the name Orborosia. A note from the author. Orb, poetically, a globe, when speaking of the heavenly bodies. By extension, any species of globular body. At the sight of Kraken she uttered a cry of alarm, and darted forward to escape from him but the hero seized her by the garments that floated behind her, and addressed her in these words, Damsel, tell me thy name, thy family, and thy country. But Orborosia kept looking at Kraken with alarm. Is it you I see, sir? she asked him trembling. Or is it not rather your troubled spirit? She spoke in this way because the inhabitants of Alca, having no news of Kraken since he went to live on the beach of shadows, believed that he had died and descended among the demons of night. "'Cease to fear, daughter of Alca,' answered Kraken. "'He who speaks to thee is not a wandering spirit, but a man full of strength and might. I shall soon possess great riches.' And young Orborosia asked, "'How dost thou think of acquiring great riches, O Kraken, since thou art a child of penguins?' "'By my intelligence,' answered Kraken." I know, said Orborosia, that in the time thou dwelt among us, thou wert renowned for thy skill in hunting and fishing. No one equaled thee in taking fishes in a net, or in piercing with thy arrows the swift-flying birds. It was but a vulgar and laborious industry, O maiden. I have found a means of gaining much wealth for myself without fatigue. But tell me who thou art. I am called Orborosia, answered the young girl. Why art thou so far away from thy dwelling, and in the night? Kraken, it was not without the will of heaven. What meanest thou, Orborosia? That heaven, O Kraken, placed me in thy path, for what reason I know not. Kraken beheld her for a long time in silence. Then he said with gentleness, Orborosia, come into my house. It is that of the bravest and most ingenious of the sons of the penguins. If thou art willing to follow me, I will make thee my companion. Then casting down her eyes, she murmured, I will follow thee, master. It is thus that the fair Orborosia became the consort of the hero Kraken. This marriage was not celebrated with songs and torches, because Kraken did not consent to show himself to the people of the penguins. But hidden in his cave he planned great designs. End of chapter 5 Book Two, Chapter Six: The Dragon of Alca. The chapter begins with a quote from the Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Paris, eighteen forty-three. 
Volume 4, pages 404 and 405. We afterwards went to visit the Cabinet of Natural History. The caretaker showed us a sort of packet bound in straw that he told us contained the skeleton of a dragon. A proof, added he, that the dragon is not a fabulous animal. And the chapter begins. In the meantime, the inhabitants of Alca practiced the labors of peace. Those of the northern coast went in boats to fish or to search for shellfish. The laborers of Dombe cultivated oats, rye, and wheat. The rich penguins of the valley of Delay reared domestic animals, while those of the Bay of Divers cultivated their orchards. Merchants of Port Alca carried on a trade in salt fish with Armorica, and the gold of the two Britons, which began to be introduced into the island, facilitated exchange. The penguin people were enjoying the fruits of their labors in perfect tranquillity, when suddenly a sinister rumor ran from village to village. It was said everywhere that a frightful dragon had ravaged two farms in the Bay of Divers. A few days before, the maiden Orborosia had disappeared. Her absence had at first caused no uneasiness, because on several occasions she had been carried off by violent men, who were consumed with love, and thoughtful people were not astonished at this, reflecting that the maiden was the most beautiful of the penguins. It was even remarked that she sometimes went to meet her ravishers, for none of us can escape his destiny. But this time, as she did not return, it was feared that the dragon had devoured her the more so as the inhabitants of the Valley of Delay soon knew that the dragon was not a fable told by the women around the fountains, for one night the monster devoured out of the village of Annis six hens, a sheep, and a young orphan child called Little Elo. The next morning nothing was to be found, either of the animals or of the child. Immediately the elders of the village assembled in the public place, and seated themselves on the stone bench, to take counsel concerning what was expedient to do in these terrible circumstances. Having called all those penguins who had seen the dragon during the disastrous night, they asked them, Have you not noticed his form and his behavior? And each answered, in his turn, He has the claws of a lion, the wings of an eagle, and the tail of a serpent. His back bristles with thorny crests. His whole body is covered with yellow scales. His look fascinates and confounds. He vomits flames. He poisons the air with his breath. He has the head of a dragon, the claws of a lion, and the tail of a fish. And a woman of Annis, who was regarded as intelligent and of sound judgment, and from whom the dragon had taken three hens, deposed as follows. Well, he, he is formed like a man. The proof is that I thought he was my husband, and I said to him, Come to bed, you old fool. Others said, He is formed like a cloud. He looks like a mountain. And a little child came and said, I saw the dragon taking off his head in the barn so that he might give a kiss to my sister Minnie. And the elders also asked the inhabitants, How big is the dragon? And it was answered, As big as an ox, like the big merchant ships of the Bretons. He is the height of a man. He is higher than the fig tree under which you are sitting. He is as large as a dog. Questioned finally on his color, the inhabitant said, Red, green, blue, yellow. His head is bright green. His wings are brilliant orange tinged with pink. His limbs are silver gray. His hind quarters and his tail are striped with brown and pink bands. His belly bright yellow spotted with black. His color? He has no color. Uh, he is the, the color of a, a, a dragon. After hearing this evidence, the elders remained uncertain as to what should be done. Some advised to watch for him, to surprise him and overthrow him by a multitude of arrows. Others, thinking it vain to oppose so powerful a monster by force, counseled that he should be appeased by offerings. Pay him tribute, said one of them who passed for a wise man. We can render him propitious to us by giving him agreeable presents, fruit, wine, lambs, a young virgin. Others held for poisoning the fountains where he was accustomed to drink, or for smoking him out of his cavern. But none of these counsels prevailed. The dispute was lengthy, and the elders dispersed without coming to any resolution. End of chapter 6
Book Two, Chapter Seven: The Dragon of Alca. Continuation. During all the month dedicated by the Romans to their false god Mars or Mavors, the dragon ravaged the farms of Dalé and Dombey. He carried off fifty sheep, twelve pigs, and three young boys. Every family was in mourning, and the island was full of lamentations. In order to remove the scourge, the elders of the unfortunate villages, watered by the clang and the sorrel, resolved to assemble and together go and ask the help of the blessed male. On the fifth day of the month, whose name among the Latins signifies opening, because it opens the year, they went in procession to the wooden monastery that had been built on the southern coast of the island. When they were introduced into the cloister, they filled it with their sobs and groans. Moved by their lamentations, old Mael left the room in which he devoted himself to the study of astronomy and the meditation of the scriptures, and went down to them, leaning on his pastoral staff. At his approach, the elders, prostrating themselves, held out to him green branches of trees, and some of them burnt aromatic herbs. And the holy man, seating himself beside the cloistral fountain, under an ancient fig-tree, uttered these words, O oh, my sons, offspring of the penguins, why do you weep and groan? Why do you hold out those suppliant boughs toward me? Why do you raise toward heaven the smoke of those herbs? What calamity do you expect that I can avert from your heads? Why do you beseech me? I am ready to give my life for you. Only tell your father what it is you hope from him. To these questions the chief of the elders answered, O oh, male, father of the sons of Alca, I will speak for all. A horrible dragon is laying waste our lands, depopulating our cattle sheds, and carrying off the flower of our youth. He has devoured the child Elo, and seven young boys. He has mangled the maiden Orborosia, the, the fairest of the penguins, with his teeth. There is not a village in which he does not emit his poisoned breath, and which he has not filled with desolation. A prey to this terrible scourge we come, O male, to pray thee, as the wisest, to advise us concerning the safety of the inhabitants of this island, lest the ancient race of penguins be extinguished. O chief of the elders of Alca, replied Mael, thy words fill me with profound grief, and I groan at the thought that this island is the prey of a terrible dragon. But such an occurrence is not unique, for we find in books several tales of very fierce dragons. The monsters are oftenest found in caverns, by the brink of waters, and in preference among pagan peoples. Perhaps there are some among you who, although they have received holy baptism, and been incorporated into the family of Abraham, have yet worshipped idols, like the ancient Romans, or hung up images, uh, uh, votive tablets, or fillets of wool, uh, and garlands of flowers on the branches of some sacred tree. Uh, or perhaps some of the women penguins have danced round a magic stone, uh, and drunk water from the fountains where the nymphs dwell. If it be so, believe, O penguins, that the Lord has sent this dragon to punish all for the crimes of some, and to lead you, O children of the penguins, to exterminate blasphemy, superstition, and impiety from amongst you. For this reason I advise, as a remedy against the great evil from which you suffer, that you carefully search your dwellings for idolatry, and extirpate it from them. I think it would also be efficacious to pray and to do penance. Thus spoke the holy male, and the elders of the penguin people kissed his feet and returned to their villages with renewed hope. End of chapter 7 Book 2, Chapter 8 The Dragon of Alca, Continuation Following the counsel of the Holy Mail, the inhabitants of Alca endeavored to uproot the superstitions that had sprung up amongst them. They took care to prevent the girls from dancing with incantations round the fairy tree. Young mothers were sternly forbidden to rub their children against the stones that stood upright in the fields, so as to make them strong. 
an old man of Dombey who foretold the future by shaking grains of barley on a sieve, was thrown into a well. However, each night the monster still raided the poultry yards and the cattle sheds. The frightened peasants barricaded themselves in their houses. A woman with child who saw the shadow of a dragon on the road, through a window in the moonlight, was so terrified that she was brought to bed before her time. In those days of trial, the holy male meditated unceasingly on the nature of dragons and the means of combating them. After six months of study and prayer, he thought he had found what he sought. One evening, as he was walking by the sea with a young monk called Samuel, he expressed his thought to him in these terms. I have studied at length the history and habits of dragons, not to satisfy a vain curiosity, but to discover examples to follow in the present circumstances. For such, Samuel, my son, is the use of history. It is an invariable fact that dragons are extremely vigilant. They never sleep, and for this reason we often find them employed in guarding treasures. A dragon guarded at Colchis the golden fleece that Jason conquered from him. A dragon watched over the golden apples in the garden of the Hesperides. He was killed by Hercules and transformed into a star by Juno. This fact is related in some books, and if it be true, it was done by magic, for the gods of the pagans are in reality demons. A dragon prevented barbarous and ignorant men from drinking at the fountain of Castalia. We must also remember the dragon of Andromeda, which was slain by Perseus. But let us turn from these pagan fables, in which error is always mixed with truth. We meet dragons in the histories of the glorious archangel Michael, of St. George, uh, St. Philip, St. James the Great, St. Patrick, St. Martha, and, and St. Margaret. And it is in such writings, since they are worthy of full credence, that we ought to look for comfort and counsel. The story of the dragon of Selena offers us particularly precious examples. You must know, my son, that on the banks of a vast pool, close to that town, there dwelt a dragon who sometimes approached the walls and, and poisoned with his breath all who dwelt in the suburbs, and that they might not be devoured by the monster. The, the inhabitants of Selena delivered up to him one of their number every morning. The victim was chosen by lot, and after a hundred others, the, the lot fell upon the king's daughter. Now St. George, who was a military tribune, as he passed through the town of Selena, learned that the king's daughter had just been given to the fierce beast. He immediately mounted his horse, and armed with his lance, rushed to encounter the dragon, whom he reached just as the monster was about to devour the royal virgin. And when St. George had overthrown the dragon, the king's daughter fastened her girdle round the beast's neck, and he followed her like a dog led on a leash. That is an example for us of the power of virgins over dragons. The history of St. Martha furnishes us with a still more certain proof. Uh, do, do you know the story, Samuel, my son? Uh, yes, father, answered Samuel. And the blessed male went on. There was a forest on the banks of the Rhone, between Arles and Avignon, a dragon half quadruped and half fish, larger than an ox, with sharp teeth like horns and huge wings at his shoulders. He sank the boats and devoured their passengers. Now St. Martha, at the entreaty of the people, approached this dragon, whom she found devouring a man. She put her girdle round his neck and led him easily into the town. These two examples lead me to think that we should have recourse to the power of some virgin, so as to conquer the dragon, who scatters terror and death throughout the island of Alca. For this reason, Samuel, my son, gird up thy loins and go, I pray thee, with two of thy companions, into all of the villages of this island, and proclaim everywhere that a virgin alone shall be able to deliver the island from the monster that devastates it. Thou shalt sing psalms and canticles, and thou shalt say, O sons of the penguins, if there be among you a pure virgin, let her arise and go, armed with the sign of the cross, to combat the dragon. Thus the old man spake, and Samuel promised to obey him. 
The next day he girded up his loins, and set out with two of his companions, to proclaim to the inhabitants of Alco that a virgin alone would be able to deliver the penguins from the rage of the dragon. End of chapter 8 Book 2, Chapter 9 The Dragon of Alca Continuation Orborosia loved her husband, but she did not love him alone. At the hour when Venus lightens in the pale sky, whilst Kraken scattered terror through the villages, she used to visit in his moving hut a young shepherd of Dale called Marcel, whose pleasing form was invested with inexhaustible vigor. The fair Orborosia shared the shepherd's aromatic couch with delight, but far from making herself known to him she took the name of Bridget, and said that she was the daughter of a gardener in the Bay of Divers. When regretfully she left his arms, she walked across the smoking fields towards the coast of shadows, and if she happened to meet some belated peasant, she immediately spread out her garments like great wings, and cried, Passer-by, lower your eyes, that you may not have to say, Alas, alas, woe is me, for I have seen the angel of the Lord. The villagers tremblingly knelt with their faces to the ground, and several of them used to say that angels, whom it would be death to see, passed along the roads of the island in the night-time. Kraken did not know of the loves of Orborosia and Marcel, for he was a hero, and heroes never discover the secrets of their wives. But though he did not know of these loves, he reaped the benefit of them. Every night he found his companion more good-humoured and more beautiful, exhaling pleasure and perfuming the nuptial bed with a delicious odour of fennel and vervain. She loved Kraken with a love that never became importunate or anxious, because she did not rest its whole weight on him alone. This lucky infidelity of Orborosia was destined soon to save the hero from a great peril, and to assure his fortune and his glory for ever. For it happened that she saw, passing in the twilight, a neat herd from Belmont, who was goading on his oxen, and she fell more deeply in love with him than she had ever been with the shepherd Marcel. He was hunchbacked, his shoulders were higher than his ears, his body was supported by legs of different lengths, his rolling eyes flashed from beneath his matted hair, from his throat issued a hoarse voice and strident laughter. He smelt of the cowshed. However, to her, he was beautiful. A plant, as Natho says, has been loved by one, a stream by another, a beast by a third. Now one day, as she was sighing within the neat herd's arms in a village barn, suddenly the blasts of a trumpet with sounds and footsteps fell upon her ears. She looked through the window and saw the inhabitants gathered in the marketplace round a young monk, who, standing upon a rock, uttered these words in a distinct voice. The inhabitants of Belmont, Abbot Male, our venerable father, informs you through my mouth that neither by strength nor skill in arms shall you prevail against the dragon. But the beast shall be overcome by a virgin. If then there be among you a perfectly pure virgin, let her arise and go towards the monster. And when she meets him, let her tie her girdle round his neck, and she shall lead him as easily as if he were a little dog. And the young monk, replacing his hood upon his head, departed to carry the proclamation of the blessed male to other villages. Orborosia sat in the amorous straw, resting her head in her hand, and supporting her elbow upon her knee, meditating on what she had just heard. Although so far as Kraken was concerned, she feared the power of a virgin much less than the strength of armed men, she did not feel reassured by the proclamation of the blessed male. A vague but sure instinct ruled her mind, and warned her that Kraken could not henceforth be a dragon with safety. She said to the neat herd, My own heart, what do you think about the dragon? The rustic shook his head. It is certain that dragons laid waste the earth in ancient times, and some have been seen as large as mountains, but they come no longer. And I believe that what has been taken for a dragon is not one at all, but pirates or merchants who have carried off the fair Orborosia and the best of the children of Alca in their ships. But if one of those brigands attempts to rob me of my oxen, I will either by force or craft find a way to prevent him from doing me any harm. This remark of the neatherd increased Orborosia's apprehensions, 
and added to her solicitude for the husband whom she loved. End of chapter 9 Book 2, Chapter 10, The Dragon of Alca Continuation The days passed by, and no maiden arose in the island to combat the monster. And in the wooden monastery, old Mail, seated on a bench in the shade of an old fig-tree, accompanied by a pious monk called Regimental, kept asking himself anxiously and sadly how it was that there was not in Alca a single virgin fit to overthrow the monster. He sighed, and Brother Regimental sighed too. At that moment old Mail called young Samuel, who happened to pass through the garden, and said to him, "'I have meditated anew, my son, on the means of destroying the dragon who devours the flower of our youth, our flocks, and our harvests. In this respect, the story of the dragons of St. Rioc and of St. Paul de Leon seems to me particularly instructive. The dragon of St. Rioc was six fathoms long. His head was derived from the cock and the basilisk, his body from the ox and the serpent. He, he ravaged the banks of the Elorn in the time of King Bristocus. St. Rioc, then aged two years, led him by a leash to the sea, in which the monster drowned himself of his own accord. St. Paul's dragon was sixty feet long and not less terrible. The blessed apostle of Leon bound him with his stole and allowed a young noble of great purity of life to lead him. These examples prove that in the eyes of God a chaste young man is as agreeable as a chaste girl. Heaven makes no distinction between them. For this reason, my son, if you believe what I say, we will both go to the coast of shadows. When we reach the dragon's cavern, we will call the monster in a loud voice, and when he comes forth I will tie my stole round his neck, and you will lead him to the sea, where he will not fail to drown himself. At the old man's words Samuel cast down his head and did not answer. You seem to hesitate, my son, said Mail. Brother Regimental, contrary to his custom, spoke without being addressed. There is at least cause for some hesitation, said he. St. Rioc was only two years old when he overcame the dragon. Who says that nine or ten years later he could have done as much? Remember, father, that the dragon who is devastating our island has devoured little Elo and four or five other young boys. Brother Samuel is not so presumptuous as to believe that it Nineteen years of age he is more innocent than they were at twelve and fourteen. Alas, added the monk with a groan, who can boast of being chaste in this world, where everything gives the example and model of love, where all things in nature, animals and plants, show us the caresses of love, and advise us to share them? Animals are eager to unite in their own fashion. But the various marriages of quadrupeds, birds, fishes, and reptiles are far from equaling in lust the nuptials of the trees. The greatest extremes of lewdness that the pagans have imagined in their fables are outstripped by the simple flowers of the field. And if you knew the irregularities of lilies and roses, you would take those chalices of impurity, those vases of scandal, away from your altars. "'Do not speak in this way, Brother Regimental,' answered Old Mail. "'Since they are subject to the laws of nature, animals and plants are always innocent. They have no souls to save, whilst man—' "'You are right,' replied Brother Regimental. "'It is quite a different thing. But do not send young Samuel to the dragon. The dragon might devour him. For the last five years Samuel is not in a state to show his innocence to monsters. In the year of the comet, the devil, in order to seduce him, put in his path a milkmaid, who was lifting up her petticoat to cross a ford. Samuel was tempted, but he overcame the temptation. The devil, who never tires, sent him the image of that young girl in a dream. The shade did what the reality was unable to accomplish, and Samuel yielded. When he awoke, he moistened his couch with his tears. But, alas, repentance did not give him back his innocence. As he listened to this story, Samuel asked himself how his secret could be known, for he was ignorant that the devil had borrowed the appearance of Brother Regimental, so as to trouble the hearts of the monks of Alca. 
and old Mail remained deep in thought, and kept asking himself in grief, Who will deliver us from the dragon's tooth? Who will preserve us from his breath? Who will save us from his look? However, the inhabitants of Alca began to take courage. The laborers of Dombey and the neat herds of Belmont swore that they themselves would be of more avail than a girl against the ferocious beast, and they exclaimed as they stroked the muscles on their arms, Let the dragon come! Many men and women had seen him. They did not agree about his form and his figure, but all now united in saying that he was not as big as they had thought, and that his height was not much greater than a man's. The defense was organized. Towards nightfall, watches were stationed at the entrances of the villages, ready to give the alarm, and during the night companies armed with pitchforks and scythes protected the paddocks in which the animals were shut up. Indeed, once in the village of Anis, some plucky laborers surprised him as he was scaling Morio's wall, and as they had flails, scythes, and pitchforks, they fell upon him and pressed him hard. One of them, a very quick and courageous man, thought to have run him through with his pitchfork, but he slipped in a pool and so let him escape. The others would certainly have caught him had they not waited to pick up the rabbits and fowls that he dropped in his flight. Those laborers declared to the elders of the village that the monster's form and proportions appeared to them human enough, except for his head and his tail, which were in truth terrifying. End of chapter 10 Book 2, Chapter 11, The Dragon of Alca, Continuation On that day Kraken came back to his cavern sooner than usual. He took from his head his sealskin helmet with its two bull's horns, and his visor trimmed with terrible hooks. He threw on the table his gloves that ended in horrible claws. They were the beaks of sea-birds. He unhooked his belt from which hung a long green tail twisted into many folds. Then he ordered his page Elo to help him off with his boots, and as the child did not succeed in doing this very quickly, he gave him a kick that sent him to the other end of the grotto. Without looking at the fair Orborosia, who was spinning, he seated himself in front of the fireplace, on which a sheep was roasting, and he muttered, Ignoble penguins! There is no worse trade than a dragon's! What does my master say? asked the fair Orborosia. They fear me no longer, continued Kraken. Formerly every one fled at my approach. I carried away hens and rabbits in my bag. I drove sheep and pigs, cows and oxen before me. Today these clodhoppers keep a good guard. They sit up at night. Just now I was pursued in the village of Annis by doughty laborers armed with flails and scythes and pitchforks. I had to drop the hens and rabbits, put my tail under my arm, and run as fast as I could. Now I ask you, is it seemly for a dragon of Cappadocia to run away like a robber with his tail under his arm? Further, incommoded as I was by crests, horns, hooks, claws, and scales, I barely escaped a brute who ran half an inch of his pitchfork into my left thigh. As he said this, he carefully ran his hand over the insulted part, and after giving himself up for a few minutes to bitter meditation, What idiots these penguins are! I'm tired of blowing flames in the faces of such imbeciles. Oberosia, do you hear me? Having thus spoken, the hero raised his terrible helmet in his hands, and gazed at it for a long time in gloomy silence. Then he pronounced these rapid words. I have made this helmet with my own hands in the shape of a fish's head, covering it with the skin of a seal. To make it more terrible, I have put on it the horns of a bull, and I have given it a boar's jaws. I've hung from it a horse's tail dyed vermilion. When in the gloomy twilight I threw it over my shoulders, no inhabitant of this island had courage to withstand its sight. Women and children, young men and old men, fled distracted at its approach, and I carried terror from among the whole race of penguins. By what advice does that insolent people lose its earlier fears and dare to day to behold these horrible jaws and to attack this terrible crest? and throwing his helmet on the rocky soil. "'Perish, deceitful helmet!' cried Kraken. "'I swear by all the demons of armor that I will never bear you upon my head again.' And having uttered this oath, he stamped upon his helmet, his gloves, his boot, and upon his tail with its twisted folds. "'Kraken,' said the fair Orborosia, 
Will you allow your servant to employ artifice, to save your reputation and your goods? Do not despise a woman's help. You need it, for all men are imbeciles. Woman, asked Kraken, what are your plans? And the fair Orborosia informed her husband that the monks were going through the villages teaching the inhabitants the best way of combating the dragon, that according to their instructions the beast would be overcome by a virgin, and that if a maid placed her girdle around the dragon's neck, she could lead him as easily as if he were a little dog. How do you know that the monks teach this? asked Kraken. My friend, answered Orborosia, do not interrupt a serious subject by a frivolous question. If, then, added the monks, there be in Alka a pure virgin, let her arise. Now, Kraken, I have determined to answer their call. I will go and find the holy male, and I will say to him, I am the virgin destined by heaven to overthrow the dragon. At these words Kraken exclaimed, How can you be that pure virgin? And why do you want to overthrow me, Orborosia? Have you lost your reason? Be sure that I will not allow myself to be conquered by you. Can you not try and understand me before you get angry? sighed the fair Orborosia, with deep though gentle contempt. And she explained the cunning designs that she had formed. As he listened, the hero remained pensive. And when she ceased speaking, Orborosia, your cunning is deep, said he. And if your plans are carried out according to your intentions, I shall derive great advantages from them. But how can you be the virgin destined by heaven? Don't bother about that, she replied, and come to bed. The next day, in the grease-laden atmosphere of the cavern, Kraken plated a deformed skeleton out of osier rods, and covered it with bristling, scaly, and filthy skins. To one extremity of the skeleton, Orborosia sewed the fierce crest and the hideous mask that Kraken used to wear in his plundering expeditions, and to the other end she fastened the tail with twisted folds, which the hero was wont to trail behind him. And when the work was finished, they showed little Elo and the other five children who waited on them how to get inside this machine, how to make it walk, how to blow horns and burn tow in it, so as to send forth smoke and flames through the dragon's mouth. End of chapter 11 Book 2, Chapter 12 The Dragon of Alka, Continuation Orborosia, having clothed herself in a robe made of coarse stuff, and girt herself with a thick cord, went to the monastery and asked to speak to the blessed male. And because women were forbidden to enter the enclosure of the monastery, the old man advanced outside the gates, holding his pastoral cross in his right hand, and resting his left on the shoulder of Brother Samuel, the youngest of his disciples. He asked, Woman, who art thou? I am the maiden Orborosia. At this reply, Male raised his trembling arms to heaven. Do you speak truth, woman? It is a certain fact that Orborosia was devoured by the dragon. And yet I see Orborosia and hear her. Did you not, O oh my daughter, while within the dragon's bowels, arm yourself with the sign of the cross, and come uninjured out of his throat? That is what seems to me the most credible explanation. You are not deceived, father, answered Orborosia. That is precisely what happened to me. Immediately I came out of the creature's bowels, I took refuge in a hermitage on the coast of shadows. I lived there in solitude, giving myself up to prayer and meditation, and performing unheard-of austerities, until I learned by a revelation from heaven that a maid alone could overcome the dragon, and that I was that maid. "'Show me a sign of your mission,' said the old man. "'I myself am the sign,' answered Orborosia. "'I am not ignorant of the power of those who have placed a seal upon their flesh.' replied the apostle of the penguins. But are you indeed such as you say? You will see by the result, answered Orborosia. The monk regimental drew near. That will, said he, be the best proof. King Solomon has said, Three things are hard to understand, and a fourth is impossible. They are the way of a serpent on the earth the way of a bird in the air, the way of a ship in the sea, 
and the way of a man with a maid. I regard such matrons as nothing less than presumptuous, who claim to compare themselves in these matters with the wisest of kings. Father, if you are led by me, you will not consult them in regard to the pious or Barossia. When they have given their opinion, you will not be a bit farther on than before. Virginity is not less difficult to prove than to keep. Pliny tells us in his history that its signs are either imaginary or very uncertain. The author inserts a note at this point. We have vainly sought for this phrase in Pliny's natural history. One who bears upon her the fourteen signs of corruption may yet be pure in the eyes of the angels, and on the contrary, another who has been pronounced pure by the matrons who inspected her may know that her good appearance is due to the artifices of a cunning perversity. As for the purity of this holy girl here, I would put my hand in the fire in witness of it. He spoke thus because he was the devil, but old Mail did not know it. He asked the pious Orborosia, "'My daughter, how would you proceed to conquer so fierce an animal as he who devoured you?' The virgin answered, "'Tomorrow at sunrise, O male, you will summon the people together on the hill in front of the desolate moor that extends to the coast of shadows, and you will take care that no man of the penguins remains less than five hundred paces from those rocks, so that he may not be poisoned by the monster's breath.' and the dragon will come out of the rocks, and I will put my girdle round his neck, and lead him like an obedient dog. Ought you not to be accompanied by a courageous and pious man who will kill the dragon? asked Mail. It will be as thou sayest, venerable father. I shall deliver the monster to Kraken, who will slay him with his flashing sword. For I tell thee that the noble Kraken, who was believed to be dead, will return among the penguins, and he shall slay the dragon, and from the creature's belly will come forth the little children whom he has devoured. "'What you declare to me, O virgin,' cried the apostle, "'seems wonderful and beyond human power.' "'It is,' answered the virgin Orborosia. "'But learn, O male, that I have had a revelation that as a reward for their deliverance the penguin people will pay to the night kraken an annual tribute of three hundred fowls, twelve sheep, two oxen, three pigs, one thousand eight hundred bushels of corn, and vegetables according to their season, and that, moreover, the children who will come out of the dragon's belly will be given and committed to the said kraken to serve him and obey him in all things. If the penguin people fail to keep their engagements, a new dragon will come upon the island more terrible than the first. I have spoken. End of chapter 12 Book 2, Chapter 13 The Dragon of Alca Continuation and End The people of the penguins were assembled by mail, and they spent the night on the coast of shadows, within the bounds which the holy man had prescribed, in order that none among the penguins should be poisoned by the monster's breath. The veil of night still covered the earth when, preceded by a hoarse bellowing, the dragon showed his indistinct and monstrous form upon the rocky coast. He crawled like a serpent, and his writhing body seemed about fifteen feet long. At his appearance the crowd drew back in terror, but soon all eyes were turned towards the virgin Orborosia, who in the first light of the dawn, clothed in white, advanced over the purple heather. With an intrepid though modest gait, she walked towards the beast, who, uttering awful bellowings, opened his flaming throat. An immense cry of terror and pity arose from the midst of the penguins, but the virgin, unloosing her linen girdle, put it round the dragon's neck, and led him on the leash like a faithful dog, amid the acclamations of the spectators. She had walked over a long stretch of the heath, when Kraken appeared, armed with a flashing sword. The people, who believed him dead, uttered cries of joy and surprise. The hero rushed towards the beast, turned him over on his back, and with his sword cut open his belly, from whence came forth in their shirts, with curling hair and folded hands, little Elo and the five other children whom the monster had devoured. Immediately they threw themselves on their knees before the virgin Orborosia, 
who took them in her arms and whispered into their ears, You will go through the villages, saying, We are the poor little children who were devoured by the dragon, and we came out of his belly in our shirts. The inhabitants will give you abundance of all that you can desire. But if you say anything else, you will get nothing but cuffs and whippings. Go. Several penguins, seeing the dragon disemboweled, rush forward to cut him to pieces, some from a feeling of rage and vengeance, others to get the magic stone called dragonite that is engendered in his head. The mothers of the children who had come back to life ran to embrace their little ones, but the holy male kept them back, saying that none of them were holy enough to approach a dragon without dying. And soon little Elo and the five other children came towards the people and said, We are the poor little children who were devoured by the dragon, and we came out of his belly in our shirts. And all who heard them kissed them and said, Blessed children, we will give you abundance of all that you can desire. And the crowd of people dispersed, full of joy, singing hymns and canticles. To commemorate this day on which Providence delivered the people from a cruel scourge, processions were established in which the effigy of a chained dragon was led about. Kraken levied the tribute and became the richest and most powerful of the penguins. As a sign of his victory, and so as to inspire a salutary terror, he wore a dragon's crest upon his head, and he had a habit of saying to the people, Now that the monster is dead, I am the dragon. For many years Oberosia bestowed her favors upon neatherds and shepherds, whom she thought equal to the gods. But when she was no longer beautiful, she consecrated herself to the Lord. At her death she became the object of public veneration, and was admitted into the calendar of the saints, and adopted as the patron saint of Penguinia. Kraken left a son, who, like his father, wore a dragon's crest, and he was for this reason surnamed Draco. He was the founder of the first royal dynasty of the Penguins. End of chapter 13 And the end of book 2